right, several news outlets are reporting the following. The Navy has confirmed that the dramatic video of an F-35 Speed Lightning II fighter crashing onto the USS Carl Vinson that began circulating on Reddit and Twitter this past Sunday is genuine. It's the third unauthorized release of media surrounding the January 24th crash that injured seven people, including the pilot. Quote, we are aware that there has been an unauthorized release of video footage from the flight deck cameras aboard USS Carl Vinson CVN-70 of the F-35C Lightning II crash that occurred on January 24th in the South China Sea, Commander Zach Harrell, a Navy spokesman, confirmed in an email. There is an ongoing investigation into both the crash and the unauthorized release of the shipboard video footage, he added in his statement. So hello again, Poser and Rowdy. Thanks for joining me. Um, when we last convened, it was this episode. And uh, we thought that would be it for a while. Uh, and then on Saturday, uh, the... Uh, this latest shot of a computer screen, and we'll go into the details about the leak after we discuss uh, some of what you see on that plat uh, tape. Um, so let me start by just showing the, the footage that was released on Sunday, and then I'll ask uh, Paddles to uh, give us some prima facie analysis. So I'm going to show this from two different vantage points. One is the one that was leaked with the, the voices in the background and everything. And then the second is a split screen of the original cell phone footage from the Fantail and the centerline plat camera. So here, let's, let's watch. And now the split screen of the first part of the uh, mishap. All right, Paddles, first, first thoughts. All right, this is a, uh, again, a, uh, a, a routine, nice day recovery. It is, uh, and, and, and this is how it is on the platform. You have the controlling and the backup LSO each have pickle switches. Uh, the controlling LSO in front, uh, typically junior uh, in training, and, and training never ends, and uh, uh, even at this point in their deployment. Uh, the backup LSO, uh, uh, typically a team leader. Um, the air wing LSO, CAG LSO is, is there on the platform. Uh, and, and may or may not be on, on the pickle, but, it, but it's certainly there to, to supervise. Uh, an LSO team will have, uh, in almost all situations, a representative LSO from each of each type of air wing aircraft. So, in this air wing, obviously F-35, F-A-18, EF Super Hornet, E-2 Hawkeye, and E-A-18 Growler. So there's probably one of each. So there's a subject matter expert nearby uh, when you need them. Um, in in this. Uh, in this plat tape, we see we see uh, uh, what I would characterize as in the middle, uh, the, uh, the the first second the, the aircraft is uh, is in a drift left and settle condition, um, and LSO says right for lineup as the aircraft drifts left. Now, this is an imperative call. The pilot must respond, and so the the, the pilot does another voice, uh, jumps in. Power and even before the word power is out of his mouth, he switches it to wave off. You see the W on the bottom of the screen. That means the wave off lights have been actuated, and now it's wave off, wave off, and then uh, and then burner calls. Um, the, the burner calls uh, lead me to believe that uh, a, a burner wave off is a valid uh, uh, command, if you will, for the F-35. Uh, not all aircraft. Had that uh, you two, you know, flying the uh, F-14A, uh, as, as we discussed earlier, Mooch, in a previous episode, 
Um, you know, burner was was not something you wanted to give because of the way the the nozzles behaved. Uh, in subsequent models of the Tomcat in the Hornet, and I'm I'm guessing here because I I don't know uh, the F35. Uh, what what I detect, I think it's all of us do, is uh, is uh, the fear in in the voice of, of of the LSO here. There's you know wave offs occur at sea every day for a variety of reasons. This was not a routine wave off. So the other thing you that folks should note on the complete plat tape as the airplane goes off the angle is how rapidly the crash crews respond. So good on the damage control teams uh, to respond without hesitation. Um, the other thing you see there, and I'm not going to do a coach's click or anything like that, but there's a piece of debris that travels along the starboard ladder line and uh we we don't know what happened with respect to that uh whether it hit one of the, if that's one of the seven who were injured or if it, if it damaged an airplane on its way forward we'll remind everybody that seven crew members were hurt in this mishap and so our our thoughts are with them we're hearing that they're out of any sort of life-threatening sta uh, status uh, but we don't know fully uh, where where they are health wise at as we're talking here. Um, so the other thing to note, in terms of some of the leaked media, in fact, this was the first item. So as we discussed on the last live stream, my first thoughts when I saw this is this was photoshopped, because that white water just doesn't look right, and the airplane doesn't look, you know, like it's normally going to be there. Well, what we know now, as the Navy has verified this as a real photo, is the airplane hit the water going backwards. And so what you're seeing here is the wake of the airplane as it's skidding, skimming through the water um, when it first hit. So whatever sailor took this picture, he, he, he took it like, you know, even before the airplane had come to rest. And we'll talk about the nature of these leaks uh, in a second. So Rowdy, one of the things, in fact, we were actually going to reconvene after we did a hot wash up after the last live stream. And we weren't satisfied that we'd spoken about PLM comprehensively or even, even you know, and there were some commenters that were uh, sort of saying, hey, you know, old guys, it's not ACLS, it's not J-PALS, it's not mode one, it's completely different. So we're like, roger that. And we set our trap lines and talked to our network. Uh, Thanks to uh, our viewer, Hornet Vids, who actually has a very cool YouTube channel himself, a lot of GoPro Hornet stuff, so check that out. But he gave us uh, sort of a comprehensive reading of PLM. Um, so, Rowdy, I, I, let me first ask you to speak to an average workload when bringing a Tomcat into the break back in you know, your first tour in VF-74 aboard, Sarah, and then let's compare that with what we know about how PLM works? Sure. So in 1985, when I started flying Tomcats, the normal procedure, day case one, VFR, was to three miles behind the ship, you're 1,200 feet. You descend down to 800 feet into the brake. 350 to 400 knots is a nominal brake speed. Into the brake for about a mile upwind from the ship before you actually turn downwind. Uh, but your wings are back. Anyone that's seen a Tomcat fly into the brake, we flew with the wings. We programmed or thumbed the wings back aft to 68 degrees. So those have got to come out. Into the brake, we go to idle and start the pull, 4G pull to the downwind. 280 knots, manually uh, flip the coolie hat up to get the wings programming forward. 250 knots as you're continuing to slow down and maybe rolling out wings level on the downwind, you're getting the gear down. Hook is already down. You've had that down before you came into the brake. Continuing to slow, uh, boards are out by the way, speed brakes are out. Continuing to slow 225 knots, you get the flaps, full flaps down. From that point to the 180, which could be five seconds or so, now I'm trimming, trim, trim, trim to get the aircraft on speed for the carrier approach. I'm activating DLC uh, to get it ready to be uh, actuated. And I'm flying the airplane. I'm at 600 feet. I've descended from 800 to 600 feet on the downwind. And I want to be um, on speed, fully configured by the 180 so that now I'm just flying the airplane around. I may have engaged auto throttles. That's another switch that I'm, I have to reach down and engage. 
verify that those are working um, and now continue, continue to precisely fly the aircraft around from the 180 to get to a good start position, 350 to 375 feet uh, above the water um, on center line, on speed with the correct rate of descent, which I'm having to change uh, from the 180 degree turn that I've made to get to the group because it's a steeper descent rate uh, in the final portion once you're flying the ball uh, than it is off the 180. So it's a very busy time. It was a very busy, high workload, high demand time uh, in the Tomcats back in the 80s, 90s. Now, by contrast, um, what is the F-35 pilot doing? Yeah, it, it seems to be a lot simpler, a uh, much lower workload uh, from all indications. What I'm getting ready to describe has resulted in improved boarding rates, substantially improved boarding rates um, and more precise uh, or I'll say less dispersion on the touchdown point. So the hook into the targeted wire happening much more frequently than ever did when I was flying Tomcats. Um, into the break, uh, go to idle, pull, slow down. I think it's a gear down, um, puts the aircraft, tells the aircraft, uh, hey, I'm getting ready to land. Um, and then uh, the, the flaps uh, are configured. The stabs are programmed to go to the correct position. There's no trimming. You don't have to trim. Uh, and then it's just a matter, a matter of engaging the correct modes. Uh, we talked briefly, Mooch talked earlier about PLM. Um, and I guess I'll go ahead and go into that discussion. So the thing to note about PLM is the advancements in technology that have allowed the, the pilot to more precisely control the flight path of the aircraft. And it's happened a couple uh, through a couple of phases. Before there was ever a thing called auto throttles, and I'll use my training aid here, pilot pulls back on the stick, nose comes up, increases the angle of attack, and the aircraft then has more lift on it than it did before the aircraft, uh, before, before the pilot pulled back on the stick. Um, that, that made for a certain, I'll say quality of handling qualities, high workload, a lot of interactions between the nose, power, all having to be uh, managed by the pilot. Lateral directional problems that all had to be managed by the pilot with control inputs. Um, next thing that came along was auto throttles. Now, when I pull back on the stick, not only do I move the nose up, but I get a resultant power increase because it says I'm, I've got to stay on speed. If I pull the nose back without auto throttles, I slow down. When I pull back in auto throttles, I get more thrust out the back of the airplane and I stay at the same speed that I was on speed for when we're trying to get aboard the ship. Um, and, and it is definitely a pilot workload uh, enhance, workload reduction enhancement to, to uh, the flying call as the airplane. What PLM has done now, it adds to that. Um, with uh, integrated DLC that's on the F-35 and even the Hornets, when the pilot pulls back on the stick, not only do I get a little bit more power out the back of the airplane, but I get a flap extension. So I'm changing the configuration of the wing instantaneously when I pull back on the stick. So instead of just the nose pulling up the, the, like this, it, it actually kind of elevates. I get more lift instantaneously so I can go from a low uh, on the glide path up to the glide path quickly and precisely. Um, and so that's what integrated direct lift control has done for both the Hornet community and the F-35. Now we get to PLM. PLM is, there are two modes of PLM, a rate and a path. With rate mode, when I pull back on the stick, and, and those are uh, engaged by nose wheel steering, when I pull back on the stick, I'm commanding a flight path rate. So if I move the stick aft, I'm, I'm changing my flight path to be uh, higher than it was. If I push down on the stick, I'm changing the flight path to be lower than it was. And then finally, the rate mode, sorry, the path mode, the path mode is the last and the, the final portion of the approach. It commands a three and a half degree glide slope. The aircraft will fly with no input from the pilot. I'm in auto throttle, so I'm staying on speed. I've got my path mode engaged. And as long as I get to a good start where I'm on the three and a half degree glide path with a centered ball, 
I can essentially take my hands off the stick. I know that folks have described it that way, but the aircraft will do everything necessary, power, lift, um, attitude, everything necessary to fly the three and a half degree glide slope all the way to touchdown. And that's, that's the uh, F-35, and in, it has resulted in tremendous improvement in um, boarding rate and landing precision. Yeah, Jose, we're, we're hearing that the flight deck, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like a divot that's everybody's hitting from the same place, right? I mean, you just, people are landing because of the precision part of PLM, people are landing on the target wire every time, let's say. You know, and that just didn't yeah. happen previously. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. that's happening, but that didn't happen. <laughs> well, we used to marvel at the uh, hook strikes that were feet away from the round down. You know, yeah. it'd be a, there is a, a you know a badge of dishonor for the entire deployment. <laughs> um, you know, and and uh, you know, so there's no way to frame this except this is amazing technology, and the the thing that my takeaway after you know, the, the folks we've talked to in recent days and, and the, the, the presentations that we've watched uh, is the, the meatball lineup of attack scan is, is somewhat superfluous uh, with respect to if you just take the dashed line and put it on the datums, once you've driven to a good start, to your point, um, you just have to hold the flight path marker on where you want to land not the crotch like we talked about last time right because those were and you guys were talking about the hornet uh where you had a reliable velocity vector and the tomcat we didn't even have a reliable velocity vector because the ins was so flaky um you know but in the hornet at least you had a reliable velocity vector but it didn't compensate for the fact the ship was moving away from you and to the right now plm does and the other thing that's noteworthy and sort of a brave new world is as we were talking about ACLS, Mode 1, JPALS, those all depended on the, let's just call it roughly a tractor beam emanating from the ship to give you glide path. PLM doesn't care about where the ship is. And if somebody put it to me, a super hornet pilot to me, you can do a case one approach to a weather balloon if you wanted. Right. You know, it just doesn't care. So that's you know, a, a brave new world, right? And it's all self-contained is the way to, to say that. So it's an amazing, amazing system. Um, it has changed, reduced pilot workload and potentially changed pilot scan. Because what I'm thinking is if all, all I'm worried about, and this is really a rough, you know, way to phrase it, but you're just caring about once I'm on glide path, my joystick is just to keep me on center line, right? Let me just say, and you, Pilots, correct me here. I don't maybe even know what my airspeed is, right? I, I just you assume it's on. Right? Okay, I don't care. I don't care. Right? Right? Imagine you would say it's that it's on speed, speed, right? And and there's no need for me to give you sugar calls like two knots slow, XL, working fast. That though that language is stricken from <laughs> the, the lexicon, lexicon, right? You know, and, and so I mean, you know, coming off the 180, you're looking at at uh, at uh, your your indexers in your cockpit. You're just trying to hold an amber donut the whole way around. Roger that. And so, as pointed out in the chat last live stream, pilots always underlined all caps bold use PLM. It's not just a I need comfort level tonight kind of a thing. This is That's the okay. way you it's the standard system. procedure. Yes. All right. So, and we, so that leaves a big bit of information that needs to be filled in by the AMB. So we'll let them do that. Um, meanwhile, Rowdy, you and I have both worked at NavAir. Um, we still have friends and former colleagues in program offices, including the F-35. I know the commander of NavAir well. Uh, Admiral Chebby was in Brand X when Hoser and I were. Well, che uh, Hoser knows Chebs yes. well. He was uh, one of the Cat One pilots yes. in VF 142. And, uh, and a fellow Air Wing 7 LSO. Yes. And an LSO. Good man. Um, you know, the Ghost Riders. I was in the Puking Dogs. Um, and so it was Brand X. But Chebs is now in charge of NavAir. You, I guarantee you he's been on the horn with our other good friend, 
Kenny Weitzel, who's the air boss, about what are the near-term safeguards that we might need to institute. Um, and so this is, as we've spoken to before, called a red stripe. A red stripe is something that's issued by the program office that is an edict that is put out to the entire type model series. Haven't heard of this. Usually there would be a press release in the event they do this. Um, it's not something we would necessarily do secretly, um, but maybe because of the sensitivity of this particular mishap, um, they, they might have. But I think the only way they issue a red stripe is if there is immediate suspicion that it was a system problem. Uh, if we heard that there was uh, a red stripe coming out, uh, it would indicate that the pilot is saying, hey, it wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. Or the HUD in, or the visor, right? All the Correct. other stuff. That something right. wasn't working. That's right. typically, having been at Navair, as you know, the Navairs, I mean, I've seen lots and lots of red stripes. Yes. Um, and when you're on a fleet guy, these were a big red ass. Yeah. You know, and, the, the, and it meant the fleet was grounded. Typically, there was something that you had to do. I mean, the worst case was they're grounded and we're working the solution. Typically, what we'd always do is say you're you're grounded until you do this inspection or you're grounded until you do this check or you validate that the system's working, whatever. Uh, right. That's a typical red strike. Uh, the rest is informal corrective action based on A and B takeaways. Um, so we'll wait for that. Um, so the other thing, and Hoser, you and I were talking about the first deployment of the Super Hornet in 2005. I happened to be working at the Super Hornet program office at that time. And it was VFA 115. Zoyle Penfield was the skipper. Uh, and Rowdy, you were working at NAVAIR at that time in the, uh, in the front office. And uh, I remember that that squadron was hand-picked mm -hmm. from the front office to the JO. So I imagine that VFA 147 is similarly handpicked, including Cat 1s. What do we think? Yeah, I, I see no reason why they wouldn't be. I mean, it was, uh, it is important to um, put the best foot forward on that first deployment. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, we've had this mishap, but it would make sense that it's it's the cream of the crop. Selected. For I was that. at the, I was at Cecil Field when the the first Atlantic Fleet FA 18s arrived, and and, and yeah, so those air, air those squadron had uh, strong ready rooms handpicked. Well, it was the same with the first generation of Tomcats because Rowdy and I had those guys as our skippers when we were Cat ones, and you know they were all awesome Vietnam era F four F eight Vigi guys, right? So you know let's just go with the baseline. Of this a very talented ready room. Fifth month of cruise. Um, you know, we talk about complacency. When I was editor of Approach Magazine at the Naval Safety Center, that was actually a theme issue we did, complacency. So things get rote, routine. If you're doing like Operation Southern Watch, con ops, you know, it's like, remember what we did yesterday? Let's do it again today. Even things like tanking off a heavy tanker became sort of routine, let me say. Not to say it wasn't easy or it was easy, uh, but... There can a malaise can creep in and maybe a comfort that uh, can be uh, dangerous at some level. Absolutely. This is a subject that is discussed in ready rooms uh, at, at, all the time. Um, uh, certainly, uh, you know, during that part of cruise at, at home. Yes. Uh, um, uh, complacency. Right. So, you know, brief the flight, fly the brief, debrief the flight. You know, we have tendencies to like take off your flight gear and go to mid rats and we'll brief over sliders. You know, maybe that's not going to be a thorough debrief I'm suggesting, you know, so it's just culturally, this is, this is what can happen. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying this did happen, but we're just sort of thinking uh, as ex guys have done a deployment or two fifth month is kind of uh, the, the, the one to watch because you're not, your countdown calendar isn't close in enough, especially these days of eight to 10 month cruises, right? Nobody's doing six month cruises anymore. So if this is month five, in some ways they're only halfway done, you know, and, and although I do not know what their op tempo is, uh, but you're, you've been gone a long time. It's still the finish line isn't in sight. You know, that's attitudinally that can be a challenge. Right. I think it goes back to what 
what we've all been trained to, Hoser, me, anyone that's flown carrier approaches, I don't care whether you're flying F-35s today or A7s or, or earlier, you got to get to a good start. In the day VFR pattern, you got to be on speed, rolling out on center line uh, with the right power setting to, to fly a good approach. And when I look at that video, I, I don't see smoke coming out the back of that airplane. And even with the power reduction that normally occurs as you roll the wings level, I would think you would still be seeing smoke coming out the back of that, engine, that airplane that the, the uh, engine is up, the throttle is up where it needs to be. And without any smoke, that tells me something's not right. He, the, the system is designed to have you on speed as you roll wings level. It looks like he may have been fast, underpowered, and then starting to slow down. And that's when the LSO starts screaming and the airplane just continues to settle, which, again, is a classic case of being underpowered uh, coming down the glide path. So what we don't know and we're not going to guess at is what are the margins that you have to get on the ball with to engage PLM? Copy, always, always PLM. But can you get to a position where it's you can't engage it because right. your parameters are, are too far right. out of whack? I don't know. Um, what we also know from our Tomcat experience, because we did not solve the flat spin program or problem until at least halfway through that that airplane's fleet life. TPS was not doing high angle of attack stuff in region four until 10 years after IOC. This was Chuck Balcom who was in my squadron after he did these things. He used to give this presentation we called what I did during my summer vacation, which was a bunch of videos of him doing out of control flight. And that changed NATOPS eventually due to the work of Scott Kelly and Rowdy. Uh, we had DFCS that kind of eliminated that as a, a problem with respect to pilot inputs. Um, but there will be learnings on this first deployment about how this airplane performs on the ball, in spite of the fact that we've done developmental tests and operational tests for a couple of decades now, right? Rowdy, you're the test pilot guy. Uh, is that true? That is 100% true. And, and I'll go further to say that off nominal, and I said this last week, off nominal conditions are explored by test pilots. We take it to all the corners, if you will, uh, high, fast, low, slow, off center line, and then verify that the system, let's call it the system now on the F-35, is capable of bringing the airplane back to the center line and on the glide path. And when I say the system, it's a combination. If, if the aircraft is not where it needs to be, it's a combination of the system and the pilot inputs that uh, bring it back to where it needs to be. So there can be some system degradation. There can be some pilot skill issue. Um, all of those things have to work together to keep the workload, uh, I'll say, manageable and the precision uh, within the within the limits. So let's uh, pivot to the leaks. So now we'll take off our aviator hats and put on our leaders of sailors hats. Um, so let me go through the chronology here. First leaked media was this image. Second was this video. And again, that was the catalyst for us doing our last live stream. And then the third, just to review, and this one has edited out the sailor voices, but just so we see it once again, and then we'll discuss in the back. So that was sent to me um, on Saturday uh, afternoon, and I sat on it quite horrified that uh, it, it was out, right? Because we spent a large portion of the last live stream talking about the flow of information. 30 days for the MB to get their findings. It's routed through the chop chain. We wouldn't see a closed out AMB for six months, and then it wouldn't be FOIA, FOIA able for another 120 days after that. And then 
No sooner had I put that out than three days later, this hits the streets. I wake up on Sunday morning and I've been uh, added on Twitter half a dozen times. Uh, and, and then it's on Reddit. It's on other YouTube channels all over the place. Um, now reported by CNN, by military.com, by USNI News, verified by Seventh Fleet as authentic. So this is a, from my poor man's, you know, sort of in, investigative work here. That is a space on the ship. Um, there's no bullseye, so you can't tell exactly what space it is. Telltale is the little microphone that you can see in front of the desktop computer, uh, which would indicate to me that this work center is used in the development of media. Uh, so, uh, you know, is this PAO? I don't know. But uh, if you listen to the unedited version, you can hear a female voice. You can also hear a television show playing. In fact, Sam Legron at US9 News in his report identified what show that was. Hmm. Uh, so uh, I don't think it'll be any problem for the ship's uh, leadership to figure out who shot the Fantail video and who is the one shooting this video of the desktop computer. Uh, I'm sure they, they're already rounded up and maybe they're even uh, facing uh, punitive action as we speak. Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine that uh, they intend to set a major league tone. But let me read the last part of this PAO's statement, because this is what kind of what I want you guys to do a gut check on. Um, so th this report says the amount of leaks surrounding a major incident like this is unusual, especially given the carrier remains on deployment at sea. Harrell, in a phone call, called it unique. I guess he's referring to the deployment or maybe he's talking about the leaks. Um, Harold explained that the ship did restrict communications immediately after the crash as part of, quote, routine protocol when you have an aircraft mishap of that nature. So this is, people have said, what about River City, right? What happened to River City? Um, so I, let's just say they did do a River City of some uh, sort, but then this is, I think this is the brave new world that, that we're living in. Quote, that situation only lasted a set amount of time, sort of cryptic language. And then it came back out into routine communications. Harold added, noting that maintaining such restrictions has impacts on both normal comms as well as morale. Okay, so there's, there's your key phrase. Harold's view was that the social media leaks are simply part of the changing landscape that the Navy now operates. Quote, you have to just understand that sometimes someone's going to do something they're not supposed to do. And when they do that, they have access to the social media platforms. He said, adding, it's just another part of life. So that's kind of a laissez-faire um, attitude, I'm thinking, right? But phones are everywhere. Maybe this is what you have to do to maintain happiness among the, the Gen Z you know, majority of your crew. Um I don't know. What do we think? You know, Moosh, this is uh, this has been around uh, before the, the three of us were in. I mean, Tom Wolf wrote about this in the right stuff with uh, Pete Conrad and Jim Lovell. That that bad streak at Pax River. You know, there's a there you see a, a smoke plume. You know, in the woods, something's happened. The phones start ringing. Uh, I was on a carrier in 1987. Had a had a, a, a fatal mishap, and uh, the, the the plat video was uh, was recorded throughout the ship and and uh you know back then you know uh vhs tapes were, were sent home uh in the late 90s i was on a deployment and uh, another fatal mishap uh, the the plat video was not shown throughout the ship it, it was it was very very close hold because the world had changed had right. uh, had, had gone digital and again that was just 25 years ago uh, and it's it's changed so much now that that's it's it's a serious problem that the navy is it's working really hard to do. I mean, you know, we're talking how we notify families and, and it's got to be done right. It's very sensitive and uh, it's, it's a problem. Yeah, I, I think that it, that uh, statement um, that you read, Mooch, does surprise me a bit. Um, there is still, there, we sailors, we have to abide by rules. And uh, yes, everyone has a phone and instant access to the internet and social media and all of that. But 
there are still rules that we're expected to uh, abide by. And for that statement to come out to just kind of say, well, you know, it is what it is and there's nothing we can do about it. That surprises me. Uh, I agree with you. I would think there would be some potential punitive actions um, because it, it's probably not good that the that video was was leaked. And but it may be we may see more of it, but there should be rules against it. And, and sailors and officers are expected to abide by those rules. So as I'm, I, again, I'm guessing that there there has been swift and impartial discipline administered uh, to set, uh, you know, to send a message to the rest of the crew. Uh, not sure what else could come out at this point uh, with respect to this particular mishap. Again, last live stream, we're like, well, you won't see the plaid tape for a long time. And that will in that we'll hear the blood curdling power calls. And, you know, we this is what we were talking about last time. Um, and, and no lie, 72 hours after we said that, here it is. Uh, so, you know, I'm kind of a digital native now. Uh, I, I wasn't one, but I became one on TV uh, some 20 years ago. And this even surprises me with respect to uh, the, the brio displayed by these members of the crew um, to, to do something as uh, deliberate as take a cell phone of a computer screen in a work center that you know can be identified and upload it to Reddit. Um, so, you know, uh, but I also can sympathize with, with what um, Commander Harrell says there with respect to uh, it's the world we live in. And you have to go to sea with the 18 to 22 year olds that you know, make it through Great Lakes and they're a talented bunch. Point again to the how fast that crash crew responded to this situation. Talented, end to end. And so I'm not going to get all, you know, hello boomer on it uh, or okay boomer on it. I, I'm, I'm just going to say that uh, these leaks are surprising and three in rapid succession uh, are, are, you know, we kind of have a, uh, a systemic uh, problem here. And I don't think this is just a USS Carl Vinson problem. Um, so uh, once again, guys, thanks for joining me for yet another uh, live stream episode. Thanks to everyone for, for tuning in. We have over 3,000 folks uh, watching right now and commenting. Thanks for uh, keeping it productive and civil in the comments. As soon as we stop this, this will be an episode on the channel. So you can come back and review the comments on the live stream and add them in the regular comment going forward. So Hoser and Rowdy, we'll see you guys again soon, hopefully about something a little less dire uh, than, than a mishap aboard one of our aircraft carriers. Maybe we can talk about some other thing about the good old days when Hoser saved my life or Rowdy and I were getting micro or getting <laughs> faxes that our Admiral bosses were finding out their punishment from the tail hook scandal. But in any case, thanks for joining me. Welcome. Enjoy it much. Thanks. Absolutely. Okay, everybody. Um, next episode is about the original script of Top Gun. Um, look for that in a few days. It's kind of amazing. The differences between the first draft and what ultimately came out. So look for that soon. And as always, I look forward to talking to you guys again very soon. Thanks for showing up for this. <laughs>